beautiful, beautiful day. Uh, it makes my heart so happy to be out here with all of you. The sun is shining, everybody is smiling, and doing exactly what we should be doing. Putting our words into action, doing something in this small way to come out and clean up our community, to take care of each other. We have a great crowd of people who came out today to clean up MacArthur Park. We've made a, a full circle around the park and uh, filled up a, a, a lot of trash bags. Uh, it's great to see so many people coming out and taking care of our community here in Los Angeles. Service in action, making it happen. We have to unite around these principles of service above self. Of putting our people ahead of profits, putting people ahead of politics, putting our people and our planet at the forefront of all that we are doing. So I'm fired up, I'm energized, and I'm full of hope because of the energy that we have here today. Determined to take action and to bring about this positive change we need to see. divisiveness is being fomented by those who wish to tear us apart. We have people in positions of power who are not thinking about the well-being of the people and our planet. Where is that conversation about the needs of our people? Where is the conversation about peace? Every time we launch these interventionist regime change wars, it is not only our veterans who pay the price for them. Every single one of us pays the price. We have spent trillions of your taxpayer dollars to pay for these wars, taking those dollars away from our communities and our people who need them right here at home. We are the ones who have the power to make change. It takes every single one of our hands, our hearts, and our voices, motivated by this love and all of us, to take on those forces and those obstacles that can seem too great to overcome. There is no force more powerful this is how we come together as Americans. This is why we fight for the future that we hope will be so much brighter for those that we care about, for the country that we love. I want to bring up the, the issue of religion because it is one that we have seen for too long and we continue to see being used to foment bigotry and illicit fears and suspicions in people because of someone who holds a religion that may be different from the most. We see this in politics all the time. President John F. Kennedy went through this test when he ran for president. Where people questioned how his Catholic faith would drive and influence his policies. I am not the Catholic Kennedy president. I am the Democratic Party candidate for president. I'm happy to also to be a Catholic. Whatever issue may come before me as president, if I should be elected, I will make my decisions in accordance with what my conscience tells me to be in the national interest. I took my oath of office on the Bhagavad Gita when I was first sworn into Congress in 2012. I'm practicing it. 
my spiritual practice, my relationship with God, is something that is near and dear to my heart. Whether it is Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Christians, atheists, whatever the path that people have chosen for their lives, it is important that every one of us stand up call out and condemn those who are seeking to incite bigotry based on religion and not allow them to try to use that to divide us because that's not who we are in this country of freedom. We saw devastatingly the impact of that in Pittsburgh, the shooting at the synagogue. This is what happens when this is allowed to continue without being condemned and stopped. This is where the result and it's out. We've been all over the day. 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 With people being shot and killed in their place of worship. We cannot allow that to happen to those who may share our faith or those who may have a different faith. Today I may be the victim, but tomorrow it may be you. Until the whole fabric of our colonial society is ripped apart at a time of great national peril. So as we stand for peace abroad, we have to stand for peace and freedom here at home amongst our brothers and sisters. And recognize that interconnectedness and that we have to stand and speak as one. I'm inspired every day by people in places like Standing Rock, where people came from all over this country all walks of life, all different races, ethnicities, religions, people who represented and symbolized the fabric of this country and who stood courageously for life, for water. These are the people who are taking that love for each other and that love for our country and putting it in action, even if it means risking their own safety and their own well-being. We see these acts of courage around us, coming from people who are not looking to have their name in a headline, people who are taking a stand and speaking the truth in their communities, in their small towns, who are gathering in Washington, who are making sure that their voices are heard. They're not asking for much. They're asking to be able to live. Unless we protect our water, there is no economy. There are no jobs. There is no life. It's as simple as that. cannot forget our past because we must make sure to never allow it to be repeated again and to be reminded of all that we're fighting for.
much, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. Sit down. See you in the back. Thank you. Uh, and when I say aloha, uh, I mean it from the bottom of my heart, truly. Uh, my heart is full uh, to, to see your warmth, to see your warm welcome for us here uh, in the first event that we've had in New York in this campaign. Thank you so much. We'll be back. Uh, this turnout and this support speaks volumes about what this whole campaign is about, why we're doing what we're doing, and why I have so much hope for our country and for our future, and for a bright future that lies ahead of us. Uh, it's a hope that's unfortunately not often reflected if you watch uh, cable news, if you scroll through Twitter. Unfortunately, there's just a lot of uh, despair and darkness and divisiveness and hatred. But when I'm in rooms like this with people like you and I am in communities across this country. I have so much hope because of what I see reflected in your hearts. And that is a love and care for each other, and a love and care for our country and for our planet, and recognizing that the only way that we bring about the kind of change we need to see is when we all stand up, when we all rise up, and make sure that our voices are heard in every single way, to make it so that this vision that the founders of this country had for us of a government of, by, and for the people is regained. How many of you feel like we have that vision in our leadership today? No, no. And we, we see this reflected in so many of the policies that are coming out of Washington, where we have a government of, by, and for the rich and powerful, leaving we the people behind. You know, government of, by, and for greedy corporate interests, leaving we the people behind. And this is reflected in a very practical way uh, in, a, in, in a number of different issues that I know I'm concerned about and I know a lot of you are concerned about, things like healthcare. Look at the healthcare policy that exists in this country who benefits most from it? The insurance company, big pharmaceutical companies, people who are extorting the sick, lining their pockets, as still far too many people in this country are going sick without getting the care that they need. This is the reality that we're facing, that we have got a Medicare system that is still to this day unable to negotiate down drug prices with prescription drug companies. Why is that? I think that would be a no-brainer, right? Why is that? It's because of the lobbying influence of those prescription drug companies and their big money to influence in our politics over lawmakers, where they're the ones who are helping shape policy that benefits them and that hurts the people. I was just talking with someone yesterday who was telling me about a specific a prescription drug that when it was first patented, put on the market, it was $40 per dose. That company then went and sold or was bought out by another company. That $40 turned into $4,000 per dose. That company was then sold or sold the drug to another company. Guess where it went from there? $40,000. Break them up. Break them up. Who benefits from this? We certainly do not. We certainly do not. This is one example of many. We can go down the list. We see the big influence of, of uh, these giant oil companies, fossil fuel corporations, who are literally taking money out of our pockets. Close to $30 billion every year goes to subsidize their business, make it so they can make more money, while we have people scraping by just to survive. See this in the criminal justice system, private prisons, literally profiting off the backs of the American people with a business model that's built on keeping more and more people in prison, rather than saying, how do we reduce recidivism rates? How do we help people 
How do we help people get back on the right path in their life? See this in the marijuana industry, right? The opioid crisis that we're facing, there's a lot of people who are saying, rightly so, we've got to do something serious to address the opioid crisis in this country. Yet too few leaders in Washington are willing to do one thing that could actually help a lot, which is to end the federal marijuana prohibition. To see yeah. how Whether you choose to use marijuana or smoke marijuana or not, that's not even the point here. The point is that in states that have legalized either medicinal marijuana or adult use, there has been a direct correlation in reducing the numbers of people who are addicted to opioids and reducing the numbers of opioid-related deaths. So why has this not been passed into law? We have too many self-serving politicians in Washington who are more interested in looking out for their own career, their own political interests, rather than listening to and serving the needs of the American people. And that's why we're gathered here today. That's what is at the heart of our campaign, is to build this people-powered movement, taking no contributions from PACs or lobbyists, a campaign that is fueled by everyone of you. To truly fulfill that vision that the founders of this country had to truly achieve a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Putting the well-being of people ahead of profits. Putting, serving the interests of all Americans ahead of partisan political differences. Putting the well-being of our people and our planet above all else. That is what this is about. These values of service above self, bringing that to the forefront, yes, in the White House, to every part of the administration, to every federal agency, creating this culture of service to the people rather than serving one's selfish interests. Then we can come together and really begin to solve the challenges that we face. We can do things like passing major legislation like Medicare for All. that every sick American in this country deserves to be able to get the care they need. We can reform the criminal justice system by passing legislation like the one I've introduced, the only bipartisan bill in Congress that will end the federal marijuana prohibition, completely taking it off the controlled substances bill. <laughs> Ending the cash bail system. Matt, reforming the, the sentencing System. That's broken. Thank you. And make sure I'm not going to fall back on it. <laughs> Got my back. Thank you. <laughs> These are serious reforms that will have a direct impact on people's lives. Making the kinds of bold investments that we need to make to protect our environment, to address climate change, to make sure that every American in this country has clean water to drink. Clean water, clean air. When you think about it, these are the most fundamental necessities and rights that each of us has. Right? When, when we're born into this world, what's the first thing that every one of us does? Take a breath. We cannot live and survive without clean water and clean air. But there are so many people in small towns and cities in this country who don't have clean water. In the United States of America, clean water is not something that we can take for granted. Making these kinds of changes require big action, require strong leadership, and they require all of us standing up and making sure that our voices are heard. Because even as those in Washington believe they have the power, we have the opportunity to remind them that the power is with the people. That when you cast your vote, when you cast your vote, you are hiring me. You are hiring every single person, local, state, federal level. We work for you and are accountable only to you. So let's make sure we exercise that power. 
Now, in order to do these things, in order to make the kinds of investments that we need to make, to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, to address the dire needs of our healthcare system, to improve our education, to protect our environment, we've got to address one central issue. And that issue is the cost of war. We know and we recognize that since 9-11 alone, six to eight trillion dollars have been spent on waging wasteful regime change wars in other countries, in other parts of the world. Wars that have been counter to our interests. They have undermined our national security, strengthening terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They've taken a heavy toll on my brothers and sisters in uniform. Troops who are sent off to fight in these wars, leaving behind their loved ones, putting their lives on the line. These wars dishonor their great service and sacrifice. People who, like me, we raised our right hand to serve and protect this country and the American people. Not to be sent off to fight another country's battles somewhere else in the world. unit in Iraq during my first deployment in 2005 where every single day I saw that high human cost of war. Friends of mine who never came home. This is something that's deeply personal for me. For those of us who have served and who have seen that, that cost and that loss firsthand. The toll that it takes on the people in the countries where we wage these wars. The lives lost the suffering that has increased, the devastation and destruction that occurs as a result. And for what? For what? The reality is though that for those of us here who may not have worn the uniform, who may not have the same experience that I've had, the reality is every single one of us pays the price for these wars. Because that money that is spent is coming out of our pockets coming out of our pockets, hard-earned taxpayer dollars going to pay for more of these wasteful, counterproductive wars, dollars that are not going towards health care, towards our environment, towards clean water, towards rebuilding our infrastructure, towards education, the great and urgent needs that we have in this country. That's the change that I seek to bring to the White House, bringing the experience that I have serving as a soldier over 16 years in the Army National Guard deployed twice to the Middle East, serving in Congress for over six years on the Foreign Affairs and the Armed Services Committees, bringing that experience to the most important responsibility the President has as Commander-in-Chief, to end these wasteful regime change wars, to work to end between the United States and nuclear-armed countries like Russia and China, pushing us closer and closer to the brink of nuclear catastrophe, an arms race that's been kicked off that's making us less safe in this country and costing us even more money, trillions more dollars. You think about where this is going and what the consequences are. We should all experience a wake-up call that drives us to take action. A little over a year ago in Hawaii, we had that wake-up call. It was early Saturday morning on a Saturday just like this on a beautiful day in Hawaii when over a million phones buzzed and lit up with an alert that came from our state civil defense. Seeing a lot of nodding heads, you know what I'm talking about. This alert that said, missile incoming towards Hawaii Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. I ask you to just pause for a moment as we're gathered here in this room and think about if our phones went off right now with that message. 
How would you feel? Who are the people that you would think of? Where are they? Are they somewhere safe? Where can we find shelter? This is what was going through our minds. Where can we find shelter? We had college kids sprinting across campus at the University of Hawaii trying to find shelter. Where do you go? You get this alert, seek shelter. Where do you go? We had a father who lowered his little girl down a manhole thinking that that may be the only place she could be safe. The situation we are in exists because our leaders have failed us in the most offensive and dangerous way. Where you have a whole civil defense system set up You've got this fancy alert that goes out to all of our phones that says seek shelter immediately. But there is no shelter. If we got that message here, where would you go? Here, in New York City. Subway. I don't know that that's a test of nuclear fallout. Shelter. The point is they tell us, yeah, sure, go seek shelter. There is no shelter to be found that will protect us not only from the immediate blast of a nuclear bomb, but the nuclear fallout that comes after that, the nuclear winter that occurs as a result, that kills all living things, all plants. So you think about the situation that we are in and who has put us there. The people who are ratcheting up these tensions without actually thinking about what the consequences are and how dangerous they are for us in this country and for the world. This is the change that I seek to bring to the White House, is your president and commander in chief, but you know that I can't do this alone. You know that the challenges, the obstacles that we face are great. Whether it's the establishment in Washington, the military industrial complex, those frankly people from both political parties who've been dragging us from one regime change war to the next, who've led us into this new cold war, pushing us to the brink of nuclear catastrophe. The only way we bring about this change is when we, the people, rise up and stand up and say no more. No more. No more. No more. We will stand together. We will stand strong, full of light, full of love, and full of hope because we care for each other. We care for those we love. We care for this country and our planet. We will do what is necessary to bring about that sea change in leadership and policy that will put people and our planet first. So I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for your support. I got you too. <laughs> we have clear eyes about the obstacles that are before us, but we know that when we stand united, there is no obstacle we cannot overcome. And we know that when we stand united, we can and we will bend the arc of history away from war and towards peace and a bright future that is safe and secure with opportunity and justice and equality for every single one of us. We need your help, every single one of you. They've just raised the requirements for the next debates coming up. We'll be in the next two debates in June and July, but I need your guys' help for next year. To make sure that this message we are talking about continues to be heard in every single part of this country. We need to get at least 130,000 individual donors. Anybody who can give a dollar can help us get there. Tulsi2020.com. I need every one of you to both sign yourself up, but also to get at least five people to help join us in this movement to make this change. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.
TV from hemp, and if you get a chance, please tell the FDA that it does work and they need to take it off the list. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. This is something that I'm actively working on right now in Congress, uh, both for CBD, obviously my bill to end the federal marijuana prohibition, which would deal with all of the problems that we have. Uh, but one of the obstacles that we face are people who are saying, well, look, there are no definitive studies that show how opioid addicts are helped through medicinal marijuana or how people like your wife are helped through CBD products and CBD oils. So I've got a bill that commissions the National Academy of Science to gather data and information and statistics from all the states that have already legalized some form of marijuana in every single aspect of our lives, from economic, uh, medicinal, health, education, every single impact that we have. So no one can say that there's no information out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'll take one more here. Yes, ma'am. Right here. Yes. So, hi. Uh, my name is Kalmanisha John, and I have a question that's mostly about how your campaign plans to sort of combat the rumors that are being spread about you. So in my opinion, you're the strongest candidate currently in the race in the last four years. You have some people who would say, oh, Tulsi is an isolationist, and then in the same breath also claim that you're a Hindu nationalist. And then in the same breath also claim that you're only, what is this, your only go-to line is to be anti-regime change wars. However, you also have a clear domestic foreign policy that is also progressive. You're going to and so I'm just wondering how do you plan to combat sort of these claims of being an isolationist or an internationalist, given that you do have a good foreign policy and domestic policy? Thank you. That's a great question. And it's a really important one because there is a lot of misinformation that's being spread around. Uh, by people who are trying to undermine what we are doing. That's really what it comes down to. And how we, not just me, but how we combat this, because I need everyone's help in this, is with the truth. Is with the truth. And it's sad, you know, you mentioned the thing about being an isolationist. This comes up relatively frequently. It's a sad picture into the culture that we live in where people assume if we are not waging regime change wars in the world, we are therefore not having any relationships with other countries. As if the only way we can relate with other countries is to go and invade them and topple their governments and wage war. That's really sad, actually, when you think about it. The kind of leadership that I bring in foreign policy is what I've stated. It will end these destructive and counterproductive regime change wars that are not good for us, not good for the people of these countries, but instead be the leader of the world that we should be in this country, building relationships that are based on cooperation rather than conflict, based on relationships where we say, hey, I can disagree with you. You may be an adversary or potential adversary, but I'll have the courage to meet with you to have a conversation, to try to work out whatever differences that we have in the pursuit of peace and national security, because I know that if we lack that courage, the only alternative is war. That affects every single one of us. We combat misinformation and myths with the truth. Every single one of us, and that's where I need your help. As you said, there are a lot of positions that I have platforms that I have on a number of domestic issues, I think one of the differences is I'm pointing out the truth that we all have to be confronted with, that unless we stop the drain on our resources and taxpayer dollars going to wage these wasteful wars, we're, we're not going to be able to make the kinds of investments we need. So I'm being honest about where we're at and what we need to do to address those urgent domestic needs and policy issues that affect all of our families. So thank you for your help in raising this and continuing to spread this message.
Yes, sir. You're spoiled, people. Um, what? Thank you for being the you loudest. Uh, yes. Thank you for being the loudest voice against regime change wars, but um, my question is more concerning uh, terrorism. So, uh, in the past, you've said that uh, you want to fight terrorism with a more aggressive approach. Um, um, and you said, I think the quote is that when it comes to terrorism, you're a hawk, and when it comes to regime change, you're a duck. Um, this concerns me because the war on terror, many have said, has been counterproductive and has had the same harmful impact that many regime change wars have had. Um, you know, the refugee crisis in Yemen. You know, many wars are fought in the name of terror, but are really for the military industrial complex. And while being against regime change wars, many, the logic for many regime change wars is that um, we're removing state sponsors of terrorism. So my question is really, uh, why do you see the war on terror as separate from fighting regime change wars in Syria, etc.? Yeah, thank you, good question. Woo! So I want to be clear about my position versus what other people are doing or excuses that they're using, and there are many, to continue to wage these counterproductive regime change wars. Um, there is a threat that's posed by terrorist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So when I say that I'm a dove on regime change wars and a hawk on this war against terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, I believe that we have to be tough and defeat that threat in order to keep the American people safe. That's a fact. We can't bury our head in the sand and pretend that this doesn't exist. However, you mentioned the war in Yemen. I have been one of the leading voices in calling on the United States to end all the war in Yemen. That has nothing to do with the quote-unquote war on terror. All it has to do with is this administration using our military and our military assets to help Saudi Arabia fight this war in Yemen, this genocidal war in Yemen that's killing tens of thousands of civilians, that's causing mass starvation, greatest humanitarian crisis in the world. That's not what I'm talking, that's not the war on terror. So you've got to make a distinction here between the position I'm taking and saying we've got to keep the American people safe and have not necessarily a stronger policy, but I'm saying a smart policy that actually accomplishes that rather than one that we have seen has been counterproductive to our national security. Uh, I'll talk about the, the situation with Iran. You're talking about leaders who are abusing their power and trying to make the excuse, as in Iran, this president has designated for the first time in history the military of another country as a terrorist organization. How dangerous that is, what a dangerous precedent that says. Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, literally said, when asked, so you're saying that the head of Iran's military should be treated the same as ISIS? He said yes. That is a direct abuse of constitutional power, a constitutional power that lies within Congress to make a decision to declare the war or not. legislation to deal with some of these kinds of abuses called the No More Presidential Wars Act. And this legislation, this legislation would make it an impeachable offense for any president to bypass Congress and to unilaterally go and start waging a war in another country. No doubt. Someone said, okay, that's great. You introduced that legislation as a member of Congress. What are you going to do when you're president? Sign it. Sign it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great question. I hope I answered it clearly. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for standing with me in this.